Welcome to For the Long Run, the podcast exploring the why behind what keeps runners running long, strong, and motivated. I'm your host, Jonathan Levitt. Through personal and professional connections in the running world, I have the privilege of getting to know some amazing athletes. I've always been fascinated by the psychological aspect of running, and this podcast is aimed at exploring this and much more. I hope you enjoy. Have you guys heard of Beam? I have been absolutely loving their products lately. Beam is a CBD company that's making waves in the running world by offering products that combine THC-free CBD with other high-quality ingredients. It was founded by two ex-professional athletes with the idea that everyone should have the chance to experience what better feels like. Whether you're sore or stressed, Beam is key for recovery and self-care. Try it for yourself with 15% off using the code FTLR from beamtlc.com. I recommend Beam Dream Powder or the Focus Capsules. Welcome back. I have Emily Infeld joining me on the podcast today. Emily, thanks so much for taking some time to chat. Oh, yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. So first question is always a tough one. Uh, who is <laughs> Emily? Oh, gosh. Who's Emily? Um, <laughs> I, I'm like looking down at my cat right now. I'm like, I'm a cat mom. She just jumped <laughs> on my lap. I'm like, oh, no, Boots, don't, don't mess up this audio. Um, <laughs> I'm a cat mom. I'm a runner. I am a foodie-ish. I love food. Um, I feel like I'm a very passionate person. Um, I love to laugh. And I'm kind. I think those are a lot of attributes about me, I guess. <laughs> awesome. And uh, and you're a pretty speedy runner as well, right? Oh, yep. Yeah, that's <laughs> that should have been my first thing. But I looked down at my cat and I'm like, that's my first thing. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, I don't know what's going on with the podcast this week and cats. But yesterday I, I had a I did a podcast with uh, with a friend named Karis and her cat, uh, Tuluise, uh, spent a couple of minutes on her head. <laughs> <laughs> during oh, no. the podcast. So I was like, I was like, you do what you got to do, cat, but please just don't yeah. make any noise. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. They're always, I feel like they know when they're like, oh wait, you're doing something. It's like they're hiding all day and it's like, oh, hey, you're here doing something like pay attention to me. I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> yeah. So, so I used to be a cat person, then I became a dog person. And now my, my opinion on cats is that they're just they're out to get us. So really? it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's very much there. Oh, no. They're waiting for their, their time to, to, uh, to, um, be front and center. So here we go. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, um, not to dive too much into making this a cat podcast, but, yeah. um, since it is a, since it is a running podcast, I guess in theory, um, let's, <laughs> let's start from there. Um, so, do you remember your first run? Oh my gosh, my first run. I don't know. I do. It's uh, when I was younger, my parents always said they were like, you were a super easy baby. Like you slept forever and ever. But I think once I got to walking, they were like, we paid for it later. Cause it was, my mom was like, I would hear the <laughs> screen door and I would just be like sprinting down the street. Like as soon as I was able to. And she was like, you made up for all those times when, when you slept <laughs> through the night, when you were three years old and just like running out the door. Um, so I don't know if that counts, but that's, I don't really remember that. But that's memory from my parents just saying that I don't know if that was me loving running or me just being a bad kid, um, but a combination of both. <laughs> or getting getting out a lot of energy as a, as a toddler. Yes. Yeah, I think that's that definitely was what <laughs> probably what it was. Uh, but I did do almost every sport growing up. And I just remember hating anything hand eye coordinated. And I loved running like I just that was the only aspect of every sport I did that I liked. I wasn't good at anything else. Um, and then I was super excited when I'm like, Oh, wait, I can do this as a sport like cool, sign me up. This sounds great. <laughs> So at what point did that happen where you decided that this is something you wanted to do and, and you know, it was more than just uh, unlocking the door and running down the street? Yeah. When I was in grade school, like super young, we had um, CYO, which I don't know if that's everywhere, uh, but I think most states have it. And um, I think back when I was in like fourth grade, even like I was probably 10 years old and could do cross country and track and I would do summer track. Um, and my parents were just adamant. They wanted us to be active and be out of the house. So I would do basketball and I played softball and I swam and did tennis as well. Um, so we were just kind of doing, which now looking back, I'm like, 
they were having to shuttle us around for all these activities. I'm like, how the heck were they doing that? <laughs> um, but I, I feel like that's when I really, I did track. Um, I actually started doing race walking in, I think when I was 10 to go to the AAU nationals. Um, I think I ran the 1500 and I don't know if I just didn't run well or what happened, but I didn't make the team. And, um, I was like, there's still the race walk. Like I can try that. So I did that. And that was my first introduction to, I guess like real competitive, um, track and field. And then, um, from there, I feel like I just, I I loved CYO. I loved the competition aspect of it. I loved pushing myself, trying to better my time every week. Um, and that's, I think still what I love right now (laughs) about the sport and about running. Very cool. So in between then and now where you're running for one of the top teams in the country, what did that evolution look like for you? I think that a lot of people enjoy hearing the the behind the scenes or like the the steps to get to where somebody is today. I think that um, a lot of running media focuses on like the here and the now. And I like to dive more into the story of like, how did you get here? And I find this to be, um, hearing it from pros, I find it to be much more relatable to a runner like myself or many of the people who who are listening to this podcast, um, we might not be able to run as fast as you, but we can we can do things in a similar process or a similar approach to um, the mental side of running. So I, I find this component very interesting. So long way to say, um, what what did those years in between signing up for you know those first few races and seasons? Um, to now look like from an evolutionary standpoint? Yeah. Um, So I, I mean, in grade school, I feel like did lots of different sports and I would do um, road races and that kind of thing over the summer, which I loved. I'm like, that was something me and my dad did together. And I feel like that was one of the first, I don't know, more competitive. Like I remember doing a race and I did a 5k and I think I won like $200 and I was in like sixth grade. And that was like the most money I could ever think of. It's a lot of money as a sixth grader. Which was like a lot. But then my dad was like, you can't take, you can't accept that because he like was worried about some rules. So I was so sad. And I remember having to give it back. And I was like, I was like, I can't, but it was like for a charity. And I'm like, I'll donate this to whatever this charity, the foundation. Everyone was like, what a great kid. But meanwhile, like I was begrudgingly doing it. My dad just like told me I had to do it. Um, So I'm like, oh man, I was looking like a really nice person, but really I was like, oh, I wanted to buy myself something or a bag or I don't know, something silly. Um, (laughs) But I feel like that was the first probably introduction that I'm like, oh, you could win money when you do this. Um, And I think after that, just kind of put that thought out of my head and really um, just loved it. I Um, I liked basketball. I played basketball as well. And I just wasn't very good. And when I got to high school, um, didn't try out because I think I realized I wasn't going to make the team. I like didn't make the (laughs) whatever the eighth grade team was and started doing track. Um, We didn't have indoor track at that time. So I just did track, um, track in the spring and cross country in the fall. And then uh, we had some conditioning stuff in the winter, but we didn't have like an indoor track season, um, in Ohio at that time. And I just, I loved my team. My coach in high school, coach Emery was so passionate and just, um, really enthusiastic. And I feel like he really, um, owned in on, um, that passion that I felt for running. And I was like, so excited about it. So excited to train, so excited to push myself. Um, I just remember racing. I feel like in high school racing and throwing up after races because I just ran as hard as I could. (laughs) And also probably because I like ate a hot dog or something before. Like, I feel like I wasn't very in tune with like what you should do nutrition wise or like whatever, like what's prep for the body. I just was like, I'm going to run as hard as I can all the time. And that kind of stuff. I didn't run many miles. Um, I don't think I ran, I think I ran five days a week starting and then six days a week by the end of high school. Um, but I feel like I remember going for these, we had these workouts that I thought were so funny. It was like 10, eight, 10, where it's like 10 minutes easy, eight minutes as hard as you could run 10 minutes easy. And I like loved those. Cause I would just like hurl myself, like immediately just start sprinting and just try to hold on for as long as I could. And I think that's something that it's like, sounds crazy and kind of like, um, just (laughs) masochistic, I guess, but, um, just that like pain feeling of, I like love pushing myself and having that, like, I can't go any like harder, like I'm running as hard as I can. And, um, 
which sounds kind of crazy, but that's what I loved about it in high school. And then um, I ran really well and got recruited to Georgetown. Um, and I also, again, felt like super, super lucky that I had an insane insanely amazing coach, um, Chris Miltenberg, who, again, was so passionate about the sport and passionate about the team and um, us. We weren't at that point. um, I feel like we had some really good stars on the team, but the team in general, we were like just making NCAA cross. um, But he was like, we're going to win. Like we can do this. And by my senior year, we ended up winning NCAA cross. And I think having someone like that who had so much belief and uh, belief in the team, belief in me as an individual um, in high school and in college just really made me believe in myself. And I uh, felt like there were no limits. Like I just wanted to keep getting better and better and better. Um, And I also was lucky that I had no injuries in high school and college. Um, Like I just got to train, I got to keep working, keep improving. And I pretty much had a solid trajectory um, of improving kind of every year of working my way up in NCAAs. I had, um, I finished second um, in cross, um, second in the 1500, second in the 5k, I won the indoor 3k. Um, I had two other top 10 finishes at cross and a bunch of other all Americans. I feel like I, um, didn't have much struggle (laughs) in that point. Um, and then was able to have an opportunity to join the Bowerman track club, um, and train with, uh, Shalane Flanagan and Kara Goucher was there at the time and be coached by Jerry. And I just jumped on that opportunity and then had kind of a rocky road <laughs> at that point. Um, and I, I do, I mean, I think it's, it's hard. I'm so thankful for, for my coaches in high school and college. And, um, I think I probably was a little undertrained, which was definitely good for me at that point. And I think, kept me excited and passionate and, and continuing to go, go, go. And then getting thrown into this program that was um, way harder than I've ever worked before and made me realize too that like I have to pay attention to the little things. Like I, And now I'm at the point where I'm 30 and I'm like, man, I remember those days when I could just roll out of bed and run. And I'm like, I'll never be able to do that again. <laughs> um, and that's okay. Um, but I, I feel like I had a really a nice kind of transition into running my high school, college, and then uh, have had a lot of ups and downs. And kind of now I'm like, oh, yeah, that love-hate relationship is real because I, t- I still love it a lot. But there are some days where I hate it, and especially through injuries and all that, where it's, um, yeah, not as easy. So very long-winded answer <laughs> to your question. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack there. Yes. <laughs> um, so what I loved about that answer is – it sounds like the like your reason for running has been consistent. It's it's the like how good can I get and what can I get out of myself. I've I've started asking um, a question about success and and I want to ask you first. I want to ask you first what you what you define success as, and then I want to explain why I ans- ask, have started asking this question. So first, what does success mean to you? Oh, man. I mean, success for me. um, Oh, it's hard. I mean, in terms of running, um, I mean, I feel like success I've come to find, I think I've kind of changed what I would have defined it as earlier on. I feel like early on, I'd be like, it's all about winning and running fast and breaking records, which I do think is a big part of success. But I think too, now, just having a lot of rough days and rough years and big layoffs from the sport. I think success is continuing to plug away and put one foot in front of the other and um, just be the best self that you can be, whatever that is. If that's winning, if that's getting fifth, if that's getting 10th, if that's running a PR one year and then the next year running a minute slower, but training in in a way that your body is is capable of. I think it's just um, knowing yourself and just trying to get the most out of yourself, whatever that can be. (laughs) So I've asked this question probably 30 or 40 times now, and that's probably one of my favorite answers. Yeah. Um, The the reason that I started asking this, I asked your teammate, Carissa, and um, she said, I don't know, like getting better, like seeing how good I can get. And, and she was one of the first people I asked this to. And I was like, mm, that's interesting. She's a professional athlete and she didn't say make the Olympics or win or blah, blah, blah. 
but it was more of the intangibles and the subjective measures of success. And I was like, hmm, I wonder if this is going to be a thing where people keep saying the same thing. And I don't know, 40 or so questions later, uh, it's fairly consistent. Um, and I find that fascinating for someone who's at your level, who's being paid to compete and train and win to say, um, success is getting better and getting the most out of myself. And I think, I think that's good for sustainability, right? Like you can't control who else shows up on race day and you can't control, um, you know, the weather and you can't control, oh, maybe you have jet lag or whatnot, but you can control your effort and you can control the, the things that you can control. And I love hearing these answers from, again, somebody who's being paid to compete. Um, and I think that, um, I think it's a beautiful answer and, and thank you for sharing that. Oh yeah. No, thank you. I mean, I, I love that. And I think that's, I think our sport is so cool. Cause yes, we're all, I mean, we're all competitive. We all want to win, but I think at the same time we have to be getting the most out of ourselves and doing like at the end of the day, I'm like, I want to be my best self on that starting line and give my best effort and performance. And, um, to your point, you can only control yourself and what you can control and you can't control anyone else. So I'm like, you can't just look at, I mean, there's only one winner in every single race. So I'm like, if you're not that person, <laughs> right. I don't think you can look at it and say like, I failed or I'm a failure in this or that. I think you have to look at yourself and give yourself credit because we all work really, really hard. And uh, yeah, you never know on any given day, which is what's exciting about our sport. I think it's cool. I'm like, there's, you could look on paper and say, this person's going to win. This person's going to get second, but you never know. <laughs> Definitely. The other piece I think that's interesting um, when that's your perspective is the relatability aspect and the connection that you can potentially have with your fans, right? They can't run as fast as you can, but they can still put in the work just like you can. And they can still go through the ups and downs that, that you can. And so I'm wondering, given the last couple of years and, and the struggles that you've had, have you felt a stronger connection to the running community lately? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I definitely have. I think, I mean, the amount of messages I get about hip surgery or stress fractures or injuries in general and mental health, um, I feel like it makes me, um, I mean, it makes me feel great that I'm like, these people think that I'm someone who can give them advice on all these topics. Cause in my head, I'm like, I'm trying to figure it out too. Like, I don't know. Like I'm just day by day, like trying to figure out what works for me and it's different for everyone. Um, but I love sharing my story and my struggles because I mean, you wish that no one ever got injured and that, um, we were all excited about this all the time. And we never had those moments of like, why am I doing this? I don't want to do this, but that's not reality. That's not life. And I think, um, um, I've, I felt really comforted by that community. And I think for me, sometimes it's silly, but I like use Instagram almost as like a therapeutic, just write out how I'm feeling and, um, hope that it resonates with someone, hope that it helps anyone else who's struggling and whatnot. But also knowing that it's going to help me just like writing it down and being like, it's okay to feel this way. It's okay that I'm not ha like happy all the time that I'm not every workout. I'm not crushing. I'm not PRing in every single race, um, because that's not realistic. And I think, owning that and saying like, that's okay. Uh, we'll set yourself up, I think for more success and to just be happier along the way, opposed to thinking like, if I'm not, if, if I have a bad workout, I'm a bad person or I'm not a good athlete or whatnot, because it's bound to happen. And I think being able to bounce back from that and to be like, it's okay. Um, your life isn't over or even like getting surgery for me, which was really, really hard. And I'm, I'm still dealing with it a lot. I think having other people who are like, I, I was told I needed to get this surgery and I just, I didn't want to do it. I felt like I was never going to run again, but I have confidence now that if this is what I need to do, like I'm going to do it and I know I can get back. Um, and that's obviously that's a dr like drastic, not everyone should get surgery. <laughs> like I think yeah. like do, do what's best for you, but just know that if you have to do that and if you're required to do that, or you have to take time off, it doesn't mean you're done forever or that you'll never be good again or, um, whatnot. Yeah. I think that's spot on the, the fact that like running is the best teacher of life. It's like life in, in a, yeah. like microcosm where you have good days, you have bad days, but one isn't really possible without the other, without the, without the bad days, the good days aren't as good. Right. Oh Yeah. 100%. I, I also love, 
I love the part about you using Instagram as sort of like a diary or a therapeutic <laughs> tool. Um, I do the same thing, and it's it's weird because it's like you're you're pouring yourself out to you know thousands of people, and like I I've posted things on there, and my parents have been like, uh, "You want to talk about this?" <laughs> and, and it's just like it's like easier to share it and send it into the void to you know, 10,000 people, um, then, you know, to have a conversation sometimes and, and sometimes a conversation is necessary, but other times it's just like, you need to get something off your chest. Yeah. Hit send. Yeah, <laughs> I do. I mean, I do love social media. There are certain aspects I think that I struggle with. And I, I mean, definitely in injury phases where I haven't been running as much, I've had detoxes from it because I just felt like it wasn't productive for me at that point, which I think is also totally fine. But I do think there's, I think there's a lot of good out there. And I think if it helps, like, I'm like, this helps me. And if it helps someone else along the way, that's like a double win. Um, and if it resonates with one person, then I feel like, uh, like that's amazing. Um, and I think it's, yeah, I mean, I love that. I like that you do that too. Cause I, I think there is so much good that can be gained from it. Um, still. Definitely. And the, the connection and ability to help is huge. Um, so I posted, you know, a call for questions and I got a lot of questions from your, <laughs> from your fans and followers and, um, some of my own followers as well. Um, so we'll, maybe we'll dive into some of those. Um, uh, but it, it, but it was all around, it was less about tell me about your favorite workout and more about, um, help me. And help me understand how to navigate the injury cycle, and help me understand um, how to stay mentally strong. and And it was really cool to to see the type of responses um, for a very simple question. So let's first dive into a question. Um, my friend Jenny had a very similar injury to you, um, and so she's really enjoyed following your story and seeing your comeback. Um, these last few weeks and months. And so her question was, um, talk about the support you felt from your coaches and teammates and the running community in, in the, in the recovery process. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel really lucky. I feel like I have a, a fabulous network, um, around me. And I think that's something too, that reaching out to fellow runners, like to my teammates and coaches, um, and having Shalane, who's been through a lot, is so amazing and so helpful. I feel like she just has the athlete perspective, the coach perspective, and she's not, I mean, really not far removed from the athletic being coached by Jerry, which is, I think, just an amazing addition to our team in general. Um, and I'm so thankful for her um, and for everything she does for us. Uh, but then I think the community just... Um, I think knowing you're not alone is really, really big and knowing that you're not the only person going through this. I think that has been helpful for me. I think at times when we're injured, sometimes it, it feels like you're the only person dealing with this and everyone else is healthy and um, this or that when that's not the case. Um, and I, a lot of my teammates have had setbacks and have had injuries and have had layoffs and that kind of thing as well. And I think having someone who who knows that and feels that and knows the struggle is really, really helpful. And I think the best kind of support because someone who, um, who's been through it and they know it sucks. Um, <laughs> and I think it makes it a little easier just to know you're not alone. Um, and also that people love you in general, regardless. I think earlier on, I placed so much of, I think my own identity in running. And then when I wasn't running, I'm like, I have nothing like this is what I have. And that's not true. And I think knowing that and knowing that, yes, like I, I have this connection with all these runners and a lot of my friends on like outside the team on the team, um, in general, our, our runners, our athletes. Um, but that's not the only reason why they like me. Um, and I have a lot else to give. I think that was really helpful for me instead of just saying like, this is, yeah, this is a thing and now I can't do it. And, and that's it. <laughs> how did you, how did you get there? How did you make that transition? Oh man. I mean, I also think it's a constant process. I'm saying that now. <laughs> I feel like it's, I have, <laughs> I have days, I have moments where it's a lot, lot harder. Um, but I also, I mean, my fiance keeps me grounded and he's so wonderful. Um, I feel like he's my biggest support, number one fan. Um, 
but having him has been amazing. Um, I also, I mean, I was having like a little post Olympic kind of slump and I got my cat (laughs) and I feel like I needed that. Like I needed to take care of something else and that has been amazing. And I like, she's sitting on my lap right now and just, it is, I feel like it's so funny, but pets, like having that, like something else to take care of or to put your focus on, that was really helpful for me. Um, and I, I think it's just something as I, as I get older and, um, I have to almost remind myself that as well. I think talking to myself in a nicer way, um, opposed to like, I'm injured again. Like I'm terrible. I'm this or that, like whatever. I'm like, I'm going to focus on my energy on something else. If I can't run for X amount of time, I don't need to keep dwelling on it and dwelling on how far behind I am or whatever else is like a a not positive thought to myself. Like instead I'm going to look at other aspects like, um, I mean, in quarantine, I think it was so funny that like sourdough bread making thing was a huge <laughs> trend. And I totally jumped on that. I'm like, well, like I need something else to focus my energy on. I'm like, this took me so long. Like I'm terrible. I made so many loaves that were like a disaster. Um, and it was a process, it's but it was bread. Something- How can it be a disaster? Oh my gosh. I, well, I, one, <laughs> I made one loaf that looked so beautiful and then we cut into it and I forgot to put salt in it and it tasted <laughs> terrible. It was like, tasted like nothing. And Max is like, I don't understand. Like how, what did you do? I'm like, I think I just forgot to add salt, but I guess that salt's really important because this tastes terrible. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but be, I mean, basically I think I, I don't feel like I have it together all the time, but I think I'm, I'm learning more and I'm trying to be kinder to myself, um, which, has, has been helpful and better. And, and I feel lucky to have the, the support I do of my teammates and, um, my fiance and then, um, the running community. So I'm like, whenever anyone sends me a message, Max always, he's like, you don't need to respond to everyone, but I really want to. And I'm like, I'm not, I don't respond super timely, but I really try to respond to everyone because I just think I'm like, if that person is really struggling and they feel like they don't have anyone right now and they can relate to me in some way, um, and I can be of help, then that will be amazing. Cause there has been times when I just didn't want to reach out to anyone and I felt like I was going to be a burden and that just left me in a darker place. And I think reaching out to those around you who love and care about you and support you, like you're not a burden, they want to help you and you'll be there to help them if they need help. And I think knowing that, um, has also been really, really crucial to me in kind of maintaining, um, happiness in, in my injury recovery and, um, just kind of layoffs from the sport. I love that. Thanks again to Beam for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. I take their dream powder most nights before bed. Dream contains magnesium, a small amount of melatonin, and broad spectrum nano CBD, and always leads to a refreshing night's sleep. I'm also a big fan of their focus capsules for during the day, containing many of the nutrients that I know my body needs, such as ashwagandha, CoQ10, as well as CBD. Focus helps you do exactly that. Visit beamtlc.com and use the code FTLR for 15% off and let me know what you think. And now back to our conversation. Did you find that when, when you had to take time off and then you came back that there was a like renewed sense of passion and fire that you might not have had before? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so funny. I do think the sport ebbs and flows so much in the training ebbs and flows that when like this summer I got hurt, I had a stress fracture in my hip and I missed the whole summer training. Everyone went to park city and, um, did like, I, I'm, I was taking time off and then, um, ended up going back to Park City with Kate Grace in August. And um, and Aisha came and we were like training there for probably a month. And I just felt so invigorated and excited to run. And I wasn't like I was just building my mileage, but just like being like my hip doesn't hurt. And like, everything's beautiful. Like we were like looking at the animals and I was just like, I I love everything. (laughs) Like, it's just like that excited (laughs) of being like, I'm able to do this again. Like a child. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's so funny, but I think I'm like, this is why I love it. And I mean, then I get into hard workouts and I have those days of being exhausted. I'm like, I hate this. Like my bot, like my body is like not cooperating and, and whatnot. But I think that's, you have to really enjoy those good days and those moments. And, um, I think, I mean, when you have a good workout and you feel like on top of the world and um, you're stoked about yourself and really excited, I feel like you have to cherish that, but cherish like even those runs when you're coming back and you're not in great shape, but you're just so happy to be outside and to be moving your body again and to not hurt. I think that 
taking time to appreciate that and cherish that, like, that's why we do it. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the like renewed sense of, of appreciation that, um, it can be so powerful. I'm, uh, I have a good friend out here in Colorado that I've been spending some time with and hiking and whatnot, but she's injured. So she, so we're not running together. And I've been thinking a lot about the injury period I had last year. So I had a bilateral stress reaction in my tibias. So basically both of my legs said, mm -hmm, you better stop right now. <laughs> otherwise it's going to be really bad. Yeah. Um, and so I took six weeks off and my first run back was a 20 minute little jaunt in St. George, Utah. Um, and I was like, on top of the world in, in those 20 minutes. And I just remember coming back with, you know, the 20 minutes and the, the five minute run, two minute walk and this progression, mm -hmm. like I've run 45 miles before and I was doing two minutes on two minutes off. And, and it was like, it was so humbling and to be able to not do like that, that prior fall, I, I, ran my longest distance and I ran for, you know, a very long time and then I couldn't run for five minutes. And I was like, I am so appreciative of my body's ability to do five minutes right now. And then, um, the pandemic hit and I was coming back, you know, the, the 20 and 30 and 40 minute runs were like the only good parts of the day. And it was, the timing was wild but I came back with this like love for the sport that I'd, I'd never had before. I didn't think it was possible. And I was like, take it away from me and I'll come back loving it even more. And yeah. it's, 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 it's so cool to hear when um, other people have that experience. Um, is, is gratitude something that you intentionally practice? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, uh, I feel like I haven't, I'm like kicking myself because I haven't been as good. But I think in after surgery, I had a, a gratitude journal. And I was like, I'm gonna write at least three things I'm grateful for every day. And since surgery, it's been like off and on, I got back on it again. Um, but I feel like I took kind of a hiatus. Um, but that's something that I'm trying to get back in my routine and trying to keep a streak of doing that. And just, um, yeah, right. I'm like, you can think of three things every day that you're you're grateful about, happy about. And a lot of days I'll have more and I can think of more things. But um, I think just having that, I, I like to do it before bed to kind of end on like a good note and a little reflection instead of like, especially if I'm having a stress day or whatnot, I'm like, okay, take a step back, focus on like what were three really good things that you're grateful for. And a lot of times I'm like writing down five or six. Um, but I, I think that's super, super helpful. Um, and just changes your whole mindset. And um, I feel like you have, I don't know, I don't know about you, but I'm like, when you write something positive or when you smile, like I do feel like kind of a calmness or more of a shift opposed to that negative self-talk cycle. And then you like get tense and you get frustrated and upset. And I'm like trying so hard to, um, to kick that. And I think gratitude is huge and helpful in that. I love that. What's, what's one of the things that you'll think about tonight when you set, when you sit down to think about the three. Oh man. Um, I mean, this is a really good conversation. I feel like that'll be a good <laughs> one. Um, it's making me reflect on a lot of good things. Um, and then my little boots kitten is right in my lap. <laughs> um, so I'm like, those are probably going to be two. <laughs> <laughs> one of amazing. Um, one of the questions that we got was, uh, when will you make an Insta for your cat? So is oh, that, is nice. that something that's going to happen? I don't, I'm like, I don't, I'm, I'm I'm surprised that anyone wants to see that. I always feel like I take pictures of her and I'm just like, oh man, people are like, oh, this girl, like we can't follow her anymore. Her and his cat. Uh, <laughs> but maybe I will give the people what they want if they want to yeah, get more boots content. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Um, did you run today? Yes. Uh, um, why? Oh, wait, did I run today? Is that you asked? Yeah. Um, and then why? Yes. Um, because it was on my schedule. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I got up. So I'm, I raised that 10 K and I've been kind of easy running, but I actually got up and I met some of the girls at Nike, which was really, really great. Um, and I did just over nine miles with them. And then I actually went 
from there to, um, I stopped at Starbucks and I got a breakfast sandwich and I ate a bar and then I went to do some treadmill testing. Um, so my purpose of the run, I guess, was, um, just kind of a, a recovery day with the girls and then to try different shoes and different paces just to look at my mechanics, um, just because I've been having hamstring issues and some hip issues. So just want to make sure I can change my strength routine to kind of reflect what I need and, um, see if running in different shoes, I I look better or worse or, or whatnot. Um, so had a couple different purposes for running today. (laughs) Cool. Um, do you think your why has changed or how has your why changed over the last couple of years? Oh, um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I still think my why, like my day to day, I look at what I want to do overall. And I'm like, my purpose of the day is, um, whatever it needs to be to like, to reach my goals, to kind of recover, um, yeah, I guess based on the day, if it's a recovery day, like I'm like, my purpose today is just to run whatever pace I need to recover. If it's a hard workout day, I'm like, my purpose is to run whatever designated pace to help me in the race. If it's a race day, um, I'm like, the purpose is to basically run as hard as I can. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, But I guess, yeah, those are uh, more of like my tangible purposes. But I also think the why, um, I look at this, I want to, I'm like, I'm so impressed with my fiance, Max, that he's run at least a 5k every day for over six years. Um, and I feel like that's something that is insane to me and amazing. Um, and I'm like very proud of him for that. And I think also my why is just because I love it. Um, and I'm doing this because I love it. I'm like, I have big goals for myself. Um, so like, yes, like part of my purpose each day with each run is surrounded on those goals and what's going to help me to better achieve those goals to help me stay healthy, but to push myself, um, in a reasonable amount. But I also, I mean, the whole reason I do this is because I really like this. Um, and I'm like, even when I'm not like, there's going to be a point you're not going to PR forever and ever into eternity. Um, I'm like, I think I still have some room to, to run faster, but I think I'm going to keep running in general. Like I, I just, I love it. I love the feeling I get. I love being outside. Um, So that's a a big part of my why as well. Cool. Yeah, it's fun to explore that and see how um, different it is across athletes. The original goal of this podcast was exploring the why. And it's evolved a little bit over time, um, but always comes back to that. And I think that there's so much from a relatability standpoint when you can understand why someone's doing something and what motivates them. And we can all learn from that. Um, which I think is super cool. Yeah. No, I love that. I'm like, you're asking these questions that are hard. They make me think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My favorite feedback from, from people on the podcast after we, after we chat is like, hmm, you asked me questions nobody's ever asked me before. And it's like, yeah. good. That's my goal. <laughs> it's not going to be an easy, tell me about your, uh, tell me about your, your last workout and whatnot. Yeah. You know, let's go deep and get philosophical here. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> um, what are you th- what, switching gears a little bit what are you thinking about on uh, a start line so let's maybe fast forward or rewind to last weekend um, what were you thinking about oh man I mean I uh, I hate that this was in my mind because I didn't want it to be but I had like a hip and hamstring flare up so I definitely that was a thought in the back of my mind that I was kind of trying to push away of like how does my hamstring feel how does my hip feel uh, like, do I feel okay? And I, that was something that I just couldn't get out of my head. Um, but aside from that, I think I was just trying to smile. I was looking at my teammates. I feel like I said to each of them and I feel like they were probably like saying similar things to me, but I'm like, we're going to get this time. We're going to get this standard. We've worked really hard. Um, and I think for me to say that out loud, to remind myself that I've worked hard, that I can hit it, but, um, just to have, I don't know, something I'm like, was looking, um, like saying that to, I feel like every, every one of the girls on the start line, um, just cause that was the goal of the race. Um, and having that, I mean, excited, anxious, ready to go feeling. Um, and I wish it was only that I hate that I had to have something else, like a little negative thought in the back of my mind. Uh, but I think that's okay. Also, I'm like, it was something where I'm like, okay, this is happening. Like my hamstring's probably not going to feel great, but 
it's not like it's not going to inhibit me. And I think trying to to change it to that, but uh, mostly positive thought within that little kind of anxious in the back of my mind, like, oh no, is my hip going to blow up? Am I going to pull off after two laps? Um, and then I try to push that away, and I'm like, just one foot in front of the other. <laughs> just try to focus on that. <laughs> so I think it's um, it's super encouraging to hear that you have that same like. Uh, is, what's happening? Is it going to happen again? Type feeling. Um, I went through that last March, April, and May, and maybe into June. I was like, I didn't really have the confidence in my own body to be healthy. I was like, my legs failed me, or I failed my legs, yeah. and um, it took a lot to to push that away. Um, so I'm wondering. Is that something that you've intentionally worked on to, to, um, I don't mean like body, body positivity in the way that it's normally, um, referred to, but like, did you, was there something you did to be more positive about your body and your strength and, and your ability to, to be resilient? Yeah. I mean, I think for me, I, it's funny. I'm like, I don't want to, <laughs> Jerry says, I feel like Jerry said this to me once and I'm like, I don't want this to be my thought, but he's like, every day when I get out of bed, I'm like a six out of 10 on a scale of 10, just like pain <laughs> scale. And I'm like, well, I don't want to feel like that. Like, I don't feel like that's healthy. Like, I don't think you should be like that. I'm like, I, I don't think that's normal. Like, I think you got to take care of your body a little better. Um, <laughs> but I do think I'm like, especially with injuries and, um, I think things create like little niggles popping up here and there. Like I do feel like we're hyper conscious of that. And that's something for me where I had worked hard for this 10 K and I had my hip kind of blow up the week before and, um, was trying as best as I could to not be mad at myself and to not like, I was definitely stressed, but to not, um, tell myself like this ruined everything for me because I'm like, you know what? I've trained really well. I've trained really well when things aren't perfect. Like I don't think, I think few people step on the start line being like, I feel a hundred percent amazing. Everything feels like the best it's ever felt. Like I don't, nothing hurts. Like I'm on top of the world. <laughs> I think most of us step on the start line and we're like, oh shoot, that like ankle that I rolled three weeks ago is like starting to feel a little icky and like whatever else. And it's just reminding yourself. I think most of the time you get in the race and those thoughts leave. Uh, but if it's something that happened freak like very recent, like for me and uh, my hamstring that I've been dealing with for a while, and it just kind of flared up and my hip flared up, um, just reminding myself that I'm like, it hasn't felt 100% for a while. It hasn't been terrible. Like I've been able to train on it, but it's not like this won't inhibit me. Like I'm really fit. I've hit workouts and telling myself that I'm like, I can still, I can still run well. I'm not going to hurt myself. I'm not at a point of like, I made sure I saw John Ball in Phoenix who I just like trust so, so much. Um, and he's like, you'll be fine. Like you'll, you can race. You're good. You're like looking a ton better. Um, and like having someone like that to give me confidence that I'm like, okay, I won't injure myself in this. I think then help me to at least feel, um, safer. Cause I do think we sometimes when we have a lot of injuries have like almost PTSD of like, I don't want to have a long layoff. Yeah. So like, what can I do? And I think there is a point where like, yes, like I, I skipped a workout. I like, I cut a workout. I took two days off because that's what I needed to do at that point. Um, but I was healthy enough to get on that start line. And I think I bounced back after the race, like this week, like I'm feeling better. Um, I feel like then, than I would have expected. Like I thought I was going to have a setback. I wasn't going to be able to run. And like, yes, I felt beat up, but I feel like my hamstring is definitely no worse than it was prior to it. And it's pretty manageable. Um, and at that point, and I think part of that is because I didn't just immediately tell myself like, well, my hamstring hurts. Like I got to pull off the track because I'm like, my hamstring is noticeable. It's like something I'm thinking about, but it's not inhibiting me. I'm not running weird. I feel like I can still move. I still feel fluid. And then I had those thoughts were replaced with like, okay, focus on the ponytail in front of you, focus on the person's back in front of you. Keep, keep putting one foot in front of the other. Um, and I think talking to myself in that way and, and realizing that like, yes, there are normal aches and pains of training, um, and things that you can get through and manage well, but there are things when you really have to back off and kind of trying to decipher that, which I'm definitely not perfect with. Um, but I think it's, I think it's a slippery slope to like, every time you feel an ache and pain to be like, I have to take a day off. Um, but then at the same time to not 
push through everything and have like, oh, this pain that's getting getting progressively worse every single day. And then all of a sudden it's like three months down the road and you have a big injury and you're like, I don't get how that happened. And then you're like, oh, because it was every day I was feeling a little bit worse. Um, no wonder this happened. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yes. I think, uh, yeah, it, it all makes sense. I think that um, the gratitude component can also be strong. I saw Shalane's, Shalane posted a couple of years ago um, a post it basically just said thank you legs and yeah. um, so in the fall of 2019 I ran rim to rim to rim across the Grand Canyon and this was like wildly out of my comfort zone and I was so like not sure of if I could do it um, but the alternative was a $10,000 helicopter ride out of there so it's one of those yeah. things where it's like <laughs> like you're gonna do it <laughs> otherwise it's like not really an option and i just remember going into it with this like appreciation for like what my body was physically able to do even just to get me to the the top yeah. of that um of that day and so i think that like acknowledging the work you've put in and the strength that you have um is is super helpful my coach um david roche uh, talks about this all the time. Um, and he helped me get through this personally when I was like, no, I'm injured again. He's like, you're not injured again. You took the time off, you rested, you know, this is your brain trying to protect you, you know, being overly cautious. So I think that the acknowledgement of like, you've done the work, um, now you're ready is, is super powerful. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh, I think a hundred percent. And I love that. I like that you brought up that post of Shalane because I do think I'm like, we have to, I feel like telling our bodies how thankful we are and like thankful that you can recover. And that I'm like, that's something that's so cool. It's like, you can have something happen where you feel so bad and you really hurt something and then your body can mend itself and then it can get back and you can push it again. Um, it's pretty cool. We are very resilient people. Yes. Um, <laughs> On that on that topic, um, you've mentioned mental health a couple of times. Um, this is something I love talking about. I love bringing awareness to, um, and I love what seems to be a trend at this point with professional athletes talking about struggles and mental health. Um, so, has that always been a focal point for you, or is that something that maybe has been private in the past and you've been more outspoken about it uh, lately? Yeah, I mean, I think. Um... It's something that I have dealt with for a while and I I think it's hard. I do think there is like a stigma around it and I think something where I think for a bit it made me feel like I'm not strong enough, like I'm like a weak person, I'm a weak-minded person and that's not what it is and I hate that rhetoric and I hate that that's what I thought um, and why I was like almost ashamed to say like I've had struggles, like I've um, had to go on antidepressants for a while. Like I've, I've had things that were really, really hard and I've had a lot of therapy and I've had a lot of help. Um, and I think I feel more confident now in that I'm like, this is something that's not a me thing. Like I think a lot of people can struggle with this. And I think, I also think it's, it's okay to struggle and, and it's different for each person. It's a, um, I mean like a, it's a one size fits one. It's not like a one size fits all. Right. Like I do this, you should do this. Like this is the way, but I do think being aware of it and figuring out whatever you need, um, is important. Um, whether it be therapy. Um, I also don't think you have to, um, I feel like have intensive therapy forever and ever for the rest of your life. Like I think it's something where, you might need it more at certain points in your life. And, um, I think to build a foundation to help yourself later on, um, will be great, but having someone that you can talk to is, is really important. And I feel like something that's crucial for me. And I go through phases of, um, having therapy once a week or twice a week or once a month or every other month. Um, and I think it's whatever I need at that point and, and that's okay. It's, it's whatever it is. And I feel lucky that I have people in my corner that I can reach out to. Um, but I do think I'm like this, we put a lot of um, physical stress on our bodies and whole, but I mean, the, the mental stress and aspect of it is huge. And I think, I mean, with this last year in COVID, I think that's something that um, was really hard on people. And I think that just not having interaction and, um, whatnot and, and changing that normal, I think 
I feel like it, it for me made me probably more <laughs> more aware of um, talking about that kind of stuff just because sure. I think yeah it's it's important and I felt like I had certain struggles and with injury and whatnot and I just um, also I'm hoping to let people know that like you're not alone it's okay like you're okay to feel like that there's nothing wrong with you and you're okay to ask for help I'm like I think that's like the biggest thing is that like people who are like ashamed or or feel like they're broken or there's something inherently wrong with them and it's like no you're like you're not I love Alexi and her book said how yes. it's like a scratch yes. on your brain and I'm like that resonated with me so much and like I just, I think it's so true. Um, and I think, I mean, her openness as well in that is like, I think when you see like hear other people do it and and see it and it helps you to be able to communicate that uh, and to be more open about struggles and, and whatnot, because we all, we all have struggles, whatever they may be. Um, and that's okay. Yes. I love that so much. Um, I think the only, one of the few good things to come out of 2020 was, the well maybe it's not good but one of the the benefits of this thing we all had to deal with and are all dealing with is that it exposed that everybody is dealing with something and just because somebody appears to be happy and um you know in good spirits all the time and running really well and all this stuff like it doesn't mean that um <laughs> It doesn't mean that it's true or it doesn't mean that they're not struggling with something. And I I, I saw a therapist basically every week in 2020. And um, I don't know how I would have made it through without it. Um, I lived alone for a while. I, I moved in with my parents for five months. I was expecting it to be two weeks. It turned into five months because I was so bored and lonely uh, at home. Yeah. Um, and... It's just like a shared, it's a shared experience and we all deal with it. And I think it's great that um, it's being normalized. And even from two years ago, it's, it's so different. Um, the way Alexi talks about it, Scott Fauble said something um, on this podcast and I'm sure in other places too, but he said, you know, you go to a doctor if you break your leg or if you have a bruise on your whatever um, this is the same thing. Like this is, a uh, your brain is, is just like any other body part. Um, and it needs maintenance and, and TLC, um, just like, you know, your quads and your hamstrings and your hip flexors, which I, you know, neglect all the time, but, um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just like anything else. And, um, so thank you for using your platform the way that you do to talk about it. Um, so that a lot of people can see that um, it's normal. Yeah. No, I mean, I think I I feel thankful for people who have been outspoken and that I've seen and has kind of helped me to not feel as, as worried or as ashamed, but because it is normal. And I think normalizing it and reducing the stigma around it is huge because I, I mean, I remember in college um, trying to talk to someone and feeling so embarrassed and then not wanting to go back because I was like, I'm not, there's nothing wrong with me. Like I'm fine. And then it's like looking back and I'm like, why did I like, why was I so against it? And why was I so embarrassed? Why didn't I want to like, to, to talk about it? And I think that's something where like, there shouldn't be that. And I think right now that's, it is a, a positive to have so much openness around it and just de-stigma, destigmatization, um, of these issues and to be like, it's okay. Um, and you're not alone and there's nothing like nothing inherently wrong with you. Like you just, you have a scratch on your brain. You have, you're going to the doctor to fix, um, to fix what, what is happening, um, with your quad as well as what's happening, um, in your mind. And that's so good <laughs> and so great. I love that. Um, switching gears a little bit again. Um, if you could go back and talk to 18 year old Emily, what would you say? Oh man. Um, I mean, 18 year old Emily, I, I feel like I was very, um, uh, I was confident in the running aspect, but I don't think I was confident in anything else. And I think I was very, um, I still like anyone else. I like to be liked. Um, I'm, I try to be a kind person and whatnot, but I do think I was probably a little more insecure with myself, um, and not fully myself because I was trying to, 
I don't know, to be whatever I thought I was supposed to be. And I think, um, as with most people, I feel like when you get older, um, and you're kind of like, I am who I am, and you either like me, or you don't like me. Um, and like, yes, they want to be kind, and I'm not going to be mean or rude or whatever. But I think a little bit of uh, probably me trying to be like, oh, I should be this way or that way. And I think that's something that I want to be like, don't do that. Um, just be yourself. And you're awesome. And probably uh, stop using self tanner. Um, cause it doesn't look good. <laughs> Curveball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, Amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know where to go from there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> besides for, besides for the fact that you've dropped using self tanner, uh, yeah. what do you wish people, what do you wish people knew about you? Oh man. Um, I mean, I feel like I'm pretty open. I'm like, I don't, um, I don't know if there's anything, um, I'm hiding. Um, I do wish, and this is actually something, I don't know if I wish people knew this about me, but, um, (laughs) during quarantine, I know they they will now. I don't know if you remember, there was like a Disney sing along, um, (laughs) with like Ariana Grande. I I don't know when this came out, but there was like some Disney sing along. Can you do it? Can you do it? uh, Can you sing it? No. Oh my gosh. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm terrible. But Max and I for a while were like playing this and I was, he kept telling me I was really good. And I think it like got to my head because I secretly wish I had a really good voice and I just love singing. I love dancing. I'm like, wish I was a performer. Like if I wasn't running, I would, I wish I could perform. Um, but I'm not a good dancer. I'm not a good singer. And he made me feel so good about myself that I started recording myself singing. And it was like, I recorded it and like thinking I was going to play it back and hear like Ariana Grande or like some like Christina Aguilera version of myself. And I like for like one second pressed it and then I was like, nope. And I was like, what the <laughs> heck? Like, what were you doing? Like feeding my dreams, like making me think like this was like my second career um, karaoke style. And he's like, you were just so happy. I just wanted you to feel good. And I was like, you just lied to me. <laughs> like, this is so embarrassing. I was over here just like literally singing while I'm cleaning, like singing, singing while I'm making my <laughs> sourdough bread, just like so shameless. And um yeah, I was like, nope, this will not be my career. Uh, but he, he was trying to convince me. He's like, we can still get singing lessons. Like, I feel like we can <laughs> sign you up for something. I'm like, this is too far gone. Like, don't like stop trying to stroke my ego. I'm not going to sound like Taylor Swift um, as much as I want. But uh, yeah, so that's something I don't know if people know. <laughs> <Until now. laughs> so, so I'll be messaging Max so that we can use this as the intro and outro music. Yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, Emily, thanks so much for taking some time to chat today and uh, hope to see you uh, out there sometime soon. Oh, yeah, it would be great. This was so fun. Of course. Where can we follow you uh, for those who don't follow you already? Um, I'm Emily Infeld on Instagram and Twitter. That's it for today's episode. Like many long runs, it's sad when it has to end. I hope you join in next week on For the Long Run. And in the meantime, happy trails. If you've enjoyed this episode, it would mean a lot to me if you shared it so that others can find it and enjoy it too.